Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Melbourne's first MedTech webinar for 2023. We're excited that you're joining us today. My name is David Nisbet and I'm the director of the Graham Clark Institute for Biomedical Engineering and the director of the MedTech platform here at the University of Melbourne. And I have the pleasure of being your MC for our webinar panel discussion. Today, we're gonna to be discussing overcoming clinical barriers to cell transplantation technologies. I'd like to start today's event by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm hosting the webinar, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The, web tech, the MedTech webinar series has been looking at key technologies that are being developed at the University of Melbourne by our collaborators and by our close friends. In 2022, we dived into some of the key advances in brain computer interfaces and whole body modeling. If you'd like to know more about our research and innovation programs, or to view any of the earlier webinars, please visit our website. Please note that this event is being recorded today uh, and the video of this webinar will be put on the university's Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology webpage. We also have Zara, our illustrator, who will be scribing for us today. So hi, Zara. I'm looking forward to seeing what you're able to capture from today's discussions. So a little bit about today's topic. Um, cell transplantation technologies have shown great potential for treating various diseases, including neurological conditions, cardiovascular disease, and even cancer. However, despite promising results, these technologies face numerous barriers that prevent widespread adoption. So today we're going to explore how the scientific and medical communities, as well as regulatory bodies, overcome issues with quality, cost and standardization to improve the availability and quality of transplanted cells, reducing the cost of the transplantation procedures um, and to develop methods to overcome issues such as immune, the immune response. So before we proceed with the panel discussion, I'd like to take this moment to thank you for joining us today. Um, you're welcome to interact uh, by typing questions for our speakers in the question and answer box to the right hand side of your screen. Some of you have submitted questions um, via the registration form, but should our conversation spark further thoughts or questions, I encourage you to engage with the panel through writing new questions or liking ones that you'd like to see answered. And we're going to do our best today to try and answer as many questions as possible. So to begin with, I'd like to introduce our expert panel. First up, we have Professor Claire Parrish. So Professor Claire Parrish is the head of the Flurry Neuroregeneration team. She heads the Stem Cell and Neural Development Laboratory, which has a broad research interest relating to repairing the injured brain. Her team places a strong emphasis on understanding neural development with the idea that recapitulating many of these early events will influence regeneration. So <laughs> welcome, Claire. Hi, Dave. Lovely to be here. Next, we have Megan. So Professor Megan Munsey is a developmental biologist and interdisciplinary scholar who leads research programs into ethical, legal and social implications of stem cell research here at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute here at the University of Melbourne and Re Renew, the Nova Nordisk Foundation Centre for Stem Cell Medicine. Welcome, Megan. Hi, Dave. Hi. Uh, and finally, we're going to be joined by Richard. Um, Richard is a professor of immunology at Monash University and is an expert in the nature and function of the thymus microenvironment for forming T cells from blood stem cells. He's pioneered clinical trials to boost T cell based immune system in cancer patients and through uh, things like the rejuvenation of the thymus. So welcome, Richard. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Dave. Hi, everybody. Thanks for organising it. Okay, so I might um, kick off today's discussion and uh, with you, Claire, uh, could you explain, I suppose, the significance and potential of cell transplantation technologies and its impact on um, patients? Yeah, sure. So as you've um, already mentioned, so much hype and, and anticipation about what cell therapies can do for us in the context of regenerative medicine. Um, I have to declare that I'm a, a neuroscientist, so I will speak more from the, the point of view about what stem cells and what cell therapy or in transplantation can do in, in repairing the brain. But of course, there's much broader implications for this. And I think one of the main um, uh, hopes that we have in the field is to see something new come onto the market. So we really have spent decades and decades 
uh, focused on developing pharmacotherapies to treat a, a plethora of different conditions. Um, and we see very few drugs make it all the way through uh, clinical trials and into clinical applications. I think this really highlights that we need to be starting to think about alternative approaches, and that's where a cell therapy uh, is, is really getting increasing attention. I think the real benefits of a cell therapy by comparison to our, our emphasis on a drug, um, often our drugs are really treating symptoms or looking at slowing a disease progression. A cell therapy can not only do this, but they can they can look at reversing some of the, the deficits that are, uh, are experienced by a patient. And particularly in the context of neural applications, we've seen in Parkinson's disease that many of the motor symptoms or the difficulty in movement that the patients have can be reversed through cell transplantation. And that's, of course, in clinical trials. Uh, in the past and that are still ongoing at the moment. Not only can we reverse deficits, these are seen as one-off therapies, at least uh, again in the context of neural, but also in other applications, that this can be a one-off intervention um, that can circumvent these disease symptoms and they can also be very targeted. So we can lose a lot of the off-target effects that we often see with drug administration, which tends to be a systemic delivery. Uh, and can have side effects on, on a, a number of different organs. So they're the real uh, impactful uh, or hope and anticipation for a cell therapy and, and what it can mean for a patient. Yeah, that's pretty pretty cool, like a sort of a one-off uh, disease modification. So um, it's pretty exciting stuff. So I suppose, Megan, um, ethically, what, what do you think we need to consider when we're using these sorts of approaches to help patients? So, well, thanks, Dave. And I think Claire's given us a, a fantastic insight into the potential of, of cellular therapies. And I think the, the the challenge is really around when is there sufficient evidence? So when is it ethical to start putting these cells back into patients? We've been, as Claire mentioned, um, trying to really harness the potential of these cells for a long time now, for decades. And of course, this is covered broadly in the media. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm in the patient community and, you know, and, and amongst uh, our colleagues in, in, in clinical practice. And I think that's, that's terrific and we want to kind of maintain that, um, that hope and, and the promise of stem cells. But I think the, the challenge for us in the field is, you know, when, is it, when do we have enough and sufficient sort of animal data, preclinical data, to justify putting the cells back into patients? And, and I think that's... Um, often something that gets a little bit perhaps lost in translation, uh, particularly in the patient community. And, and I think uh, more discussion around what we mean by evidence, um, I think is particularly paramount when we have such a, a, you know, a, a richness of online information almost bombarding us uh, once we sort of pop on to Dr. Google and now with ChatGPT and other, other services. I think there's a lot of information out there. So how do we know where the field's really at and and what's happening in perhaps Parkinson's research might be quite different to what's happening in cardiac uh, applications and cell therapy or in Richard's area. So I think that kind of more nuanced conversation and how we get that information to into the community and part of that informed consent practice when people are kind of making the decision to volunteer and participate in research, let's make sure they have all the facts that they need to make an informed choice. Yeah, thanks, Megan. That's a, a great segue into a question I have here for Richard, um, which is uh, you, you, you've sort of been in the process, I suppose, of commercialising therapies, Richard. So what are, I suppose, what are the lessons you, you've learned, uh, the sort of big insights you can offer us? Find some very wealthy friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, thanks, Dave. It's, it's been an interesting ride coming from academia into the commercial world, but the... The secret to these, I think, is to know your product strengths and weaknesses and you've got to think ahead of the pack and try not to dance at shadows and be prepared to be be flexible just as a sort of gen general approach. And you really need a strong scientific team with business credentials and clinical and regulatory advisors and methods of manufacture. So it's, it's a package deal. And the reason for that is that companies simply want to make money. They're not charities. And so you have to you have to engage them, you have to attract them, and usually that is by identifying an unmet clinical need. And and it's not much point if there's only one patient in ten billion, but it's got to be a market size which has commercial opportunities. And then you've got competition. So what's how's the novelty of your product? How strong is your IP position? And the first question that 
commercial investors will, will ask for is, their, is your IP status. And we undertook a pretty extensive review of the IP landscape in our particular area. And I think that was a really valuable exercise because it pointed out where the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the competitors are. Um, you, as Megan quite rightly said, the most important question is, is preclinical functional data. And, and, and Megan's right, this is very frustrating for patients to hear, but that's the reality because um, thankfully we, we don't allow any old transplantation to take place over pretty strict regulations and, and that it takes time to get through the safety hurdles. But um, it's interesting that the FDA seem to be softening their status on whether on how much animal data is required before you move into a clinic because there's so many big differences between um, rodents, of course, and, and humans, and particularly with the immune system, which is what we deal with. Um, so you need the product, you need, you need your position, you need your understanding of the field, but then you need to be able to produce it. And it's got to be, be produced in a reproducible manner, which is not too complex and not too expensive. And then you have to deal with whether it's going to be produced in clinic ready conditions, like GMP, good manufacturing process. If it's a phase one trial, you don't really need GMP, but, but um, you need to have a strong safety profile. And we spend a lot of time doing this too. And no matter what cells you transplant, if they've been edited or even if they've been expanded in culture, there's always a risk that you will have introduced some sort of mutations, be they oncogenic or other patho pathological conditions. And you, and you need a timely pathway to the, to, the, to the clinic. So all these things line up for the commercial investor to, to weigh the, the pros and cons. And it's just worthwhile reflecting that the current cost of autologous chimeric antigen receptor T cells, which are turning the world of cancer immunotherapy on its head, are something like 500,000 per, per dose. So that becomes a major hurdle. And um, the reality is that financial markets in Australia, you can you can hope to get maybe millions of investment, but in the USA they, they talk of tens and hundreds of millions. And, and so we, we fall behind the wayside a little bit in that regard. But um, but of course, without commercial without commercialization, our therapy stall. So um, we have been successful in getting through these barriers that I've just mentioned, and I think everyone should give it a crack. Perfect. Maybe I forget to deviate from script a bit just for out of my own interest, but um, you sort of mentioned the importance of having sort of IP protection. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, these patents will usually last sort of 20 years or so, right, where a clinical trial could take like, you know, 10 or 15 years. How do you sort of um, get an industry partner engaged when you might only have, you know, five to 10 years left on your, on your IP? No, that's a good point. And uh, I, I guess... There's always the option of, um, uh, well, it, it, I guess you, you can get orphan status, so you can get into the, 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 the trick is to get your clinical uh, um, approval as quick as you possibly can, and that, then that gives you some sort of protection anyway, first mover protection. But you're right, the length of the patents is very critical, but um, most of the patents in this sort of advanced technology are relatively new, so they've been in the, like the last five or ten years, so they've still got a fair bit of runway ahead of them. But it's on a case by case basis. Good, good practical question. Perfect, um, Claire. I might ask you a question. I suppose continuing on from this uh, about the potential roadblocks for cell therapies, not just in relation to sort of the IP, but um, also scientific, scientifically. And uh, you know, what do you see as the sort of possible solutions to overcome of these, some of these roadblocks? I think Richard very nicely highlighted many of them. So um, what sits with us still at the bench is obviously the same problems that, um, that are encroached in translation. So, uh, I mean, I guess when I think about a bit of a list of, of um, challenges that lie in front of us, I think one of the things is to make sure we understand um, what the mechanisms of disease are so that we can really understand what the, the therapeutic efficacy of a cell product can be. It really is not um, a stem cell cures all sort of approach and that we really need to come in with a targeted, uh, a targeted focus here. So in that regard, it's about understanding how to control your donor cell product that is making um, 
protocols and differentiation procedures that make a very defined cell product, is that going to be sufficient to move forward in translation or do we need to look at some degree of uh, purification of the cell product? Um, there's, of course, the risks that come with some of these cell therapies. We're often talking in the context of stem cells and pluripotent stem cell derived cell products. So are there risks of tumours um, that may be evident and how do we circumvent these? There's a lot of talk about introducing um, suicide genes into a cell product that may be able to address, with this, uh, address this in some contexts. Uh, and um, in, in that relation, uh, like Richard was mentioning, once we start playing around with the cell, um, what does that mean for um, uh, other risks in terms of how we may uh, modify the genome? Uh, and of course, it comes with then needing additional regulatory requirements to try and move an engineered cell product uh, into translation. Uh, there's a lot to be said about um, a lot of the cells we make are normally integrating into the into the organ or the in my context, into the brain during developmental events. How do we do this uh, in an adult system? So how do we get something into an environment that's now um, a lot more static than it is during development? How do we make the host environment more conducive to receive a transplant? And again, this could be a combination with a gene therapy. How do we bring these various parts together? So th there's a lot of things that come into play. And, and then the next part, of course, is cell manufacturing. Once we think we've got the right cell product, what are the resources we have here in Australia um, to enable us to move things to, you know, into trial? Thanks, Claire. Um, so Megan, how open, so this is, I mean, this research sounds fantastic, right? And the idea of having these suicide genes to control populations of cells, but I mean, how open ultimately are patients to receiving um, cell transplants? Well, I think there's been an enormous enthusiasm really for, for decades now around the potential of this area. And uh, we haven't, we have had limited opportunities for people to participate in clinical trials because it, as Richard and Claire have mentioned, it's taken, a, it's taken a long time and probably needs to take a long time to address some of these significant issues. We want to put safety as our number one priority to make sure we have a product that is um, sufficiently understood before we start putting those cells back into a person. And, and uh, so Claire hinted at this as well. I think we should also discuss and acknowledge that the method of introducing those cells can often be highly invasive. It's just not like dabbing the cells onto the skin and they kind of be absorbed. This may involve at the very least intravenous delivery, but possibly in, in Claire's work in particular, uh, directly into the brain or into the fluid around the spinal cord. So there, you know, there's significant risk associated with the delivery of the cells. And I, having said all that, um, from, from my work, um, the Australians that we've spoken to are extremely enthusiastic. Uh, in, in fact, so enthusiastic that they're frustrated by the lack of opportunities to participate in clinical research and are taking their choice into their own hands and are actively going out and seeking what is claimed to be treatment. And I suppose that's one of my key areas of interest is navigating the kind of landscape, the ecosystem in this field. We have people like Claire and Richard who are doing clinical research and leading, uh, looking to lead work in the clinical environment that's you know very transparent, it's fully regulated, uh, they want to share their data. But outside that, there's also a marketplace where you can almost sort of search for your favourite or what, what, search for your uh, a treatment, a cell treatment for your condition, and you will find it. It's a little harder these days in some jurisdictions uh, because we have seen a, a slight uh, change in advertising rules in some places, like in Australia. But it is pretty easy to find a clinic and it's easy for the clinic to claim that they treat people with your condition, um, but perhaps uh, harder for them to show the evidence that what they're doing is justified, that has a, a biological basis and it's founded in science. So uh, I think that's one of the greatest challenges. There's a sort of a rosy glow around stem cells and, and regenerative medicine, but I don't know, and this is sort of backed up by some survey data, people aren't able necessarily to explain 
what the treatments are. They just want access to it because they feel as though they have no other choice. So I think that's a uh, has been a long, uh, has been a problem and a challenge for the field for for many years, and will continue to be so. So, how do we help people kind of navigate and identify legitimate areas where they can participate and access treatment that's likely to possibly benefit them, but also, more importantly, advance the field? You know, these early stage studies won't necessarily provide the the immediate benefit that people may be looking for, but we need to have people enrolling in uh, phase one, phase two studies just to even explore safety. And those, um, uh, maybe Claire might want to talk about this in a, in, a, in a moment around Parkinson's, but we're seeing sort of the next generation of Parkinson's trials and um, it's too early to know yet about uptake, but I, from my knowledge of the Parkinson's community, there's certainly a lot of people who are interested in participating but the eligibility criteria might make it pretty tough for them. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of, sort of balances. So on the one hand, we want to have a data set that makes sense, that we can compare results to, that we can define. But, um, of course, that also means that a lot of people might have to hear that they aren't eligible. So that could be really quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Megan. Did, Claire, did you want to um, talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease? Sure. I, I think you raised some really interesting and such relevant points there, Megan. And as soon as you put, you know, stem cell therapies that are running offshore into your into your Google browser, it, so often you'll see them look like some sort of holiday retreat, beach umbrellas and swimming pools and <laughs> what a concerning um, market that's really out there. And, and, and the responsibility we have to the community to make sure that we really are rolling out the right things. And I think Parkinson's is one of those areas where we've experienced the good and the bad. So back in the, the early uh, 1980s with some of the first clinical trials in Parkinson's disease patients, there was so much hope and anticipation. And there were a number of patients that were showing benefits, but there were also a number of patients that didn't see any benefit at all and even side effects from the therapies. And that really, with time, we understood what the side effects were and why that was happening. That's helped us improve the cell products that we're working with. But it also highlights, as Megan's addressing, these are not a, um, a, a one-shoe-fits-all product that we're developing and that we often work with such a spectrum of disorders within a, within a given disorder. So how a patient re uh, responds to dopamine modulating drugs are the patients that will do best from a cell therapy. We now understand that. But where I was going to go to was, so all the trials that happened in the 80s, we then saw a, a burst in the market where trials were starting to be rolled out in many countries around the world. It all went a little bit pear-shaped and consequently all the trials got shut down globally. So this became devastating for the research sector because now suddenly um, it was seen as, well, cell therapy doesn't work for Parkinson's disease. We're all barking up, up, uh, up the wrong tree and we look, need to come back to drug therapies or other approaches. So we really had to work really hard to try and get back in the game again and say, no, we really can do this. We know how to do it better than before. We've got the safety awareness in there and under the right regulatory framework and care, we can make this work. Whereas if we move too quickly, we actually do more harm. And it's very hard for a patient to hear that, but it's important that we take really careful steps as we move these products forward. Mm -hmm. Could yeah. I just add to that? Um, I've got a vested interest in this game because I do have Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think the point you raise are really, really good because the, the symptoms are all over the place. No one's got the same, or very few people have to share the same thing. And, and the effect of L-DOPA is only addresses one aspect of the condition. Mm. So I watch very carefully the, the stem cell related studies, particularly coming out of the Sloan Kettering and Mm. And have to from your labs as well. But just going back to a point that Megan raised, uh, from the patient perspective, we often, clinical trials come in at the, at the, when there's no other choice, one foot in the banana skin, the other one in the grave sort of thing. Mm. And it, it creates an unrealistic hurdle sometimes for therapies to even to have an attempt to do that. So I think that we, we could probably look at ways of allowing people who are at an earlier stage of disease, particularly cancer, for example, or, or Parkinson's, um, to give the drugs a, be a better chance of success. 
I think that's an interest, a really excellent point, Richard, that um, who we're treating and who we're testing the interventions on, particularly once we've established safety, uh, or at least uh, had, have not identified any safety risks, um, I think that it, it makes sense that it's the people who perhaps uh, have, have still have function in particular conditions and we're trying to retain function and not and not allow that to further be lost you know they're the people that we really want to start uh looking at, at uh, other the next stage of the clinical trial process i think if you've already lost function in many applications of cellular therapy you're not necessarily going to gain function back it might be again of course i'm, I'm speaking in general terms but um it, it, it's often to prevent further loss uh, and I think that 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 often is is kind of lost in the discussion as well. So it's another excellent point. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I suppose another another issue that we're getting a, a lot of chat about in the uh, online here is um, some of the issues with I suppose rejection and the immune response to um, cell transplantation. And Richard's done a lot of work in in that space. Richard, would you want to um, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure, Dave. Uh, this is a, a transplantation rejection has been a long, 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 long history of uh, fails, failures in many ways. But um, the traditional way, I guess, is to immune suppress the patients, which which has an uh, obviously benefit in retaining the, the grafts, but introduces a whole swathe of other problems like the susceptibility to infections and so on. So it's kind of a Stone Age technology, um, although currently still necessary. Um, as Megan and Claire alluded to before, stem cell derived therapies probably add a little bit of a, a layer of flexibility that you can engineer the cell that you, you, you're you generating rather than taking just an allogeneic donor, but creating a, a new donor from stem cells because then you can, you can struct, genetically delete the MHC class one and class two molecules which then prevent them from being seen by the, the patient's immune system. But that in itself introduces another problem because when a, a lack of MHC molecules allows natural killer cells to engage those cells. So then you've got to somehow or other combat the natural killer cells and that can be done by editing in uh, HLA molecules which inhibit NK cells like HLAG and HLAE. So you can have this sort of knocking in, knocking out um, engineering process. And coupled with that, that's sort of dealing with recognition molecules, but coupled with that, you can, there's pretty good evidence now that you can combine your transplant with what we call cloaking. And so you immune, you have immune inhibiting cytokines like TGF beta that um, you can engineer into your cells so that it will it, it secrete TGF beta wherever it goes and, and therefore switch off the immune, immune response and actually maybe even create suppressor cells, regulatory cells, which, um, which suppress the immune system. And if you're dealing with T cell transplants, then it's imperative to knock out the T cell receptor because that can induce graft versus host disease, which in itself can be lethal. One final uh, thought, and, and I think as Megan mentioned, the suicide genes, I think it's also very important. But we, we, we now realise from the analysis of millions of patients that there is a, an unusual HLA type called homozygous haplotype. This is by chance that the two chromosomes in those patients are identical at HLA, A, B and, and DR. So you only have to you only have to match them with uh, one chromosome to a potential recipient. So these these cells are histocompatible with up to 18 to 20 percent of the population just by pure chance, and they're called super donors. And I know that Murdoch are using them. We certainly are using them. Um, but that's another another trick of nature that can be engaged. So, so there's model model uh, facets happening, but I think from probably I speak with forked tongue but because we're doing it but I think engineering IPS derived cells creates a, a real, realistic platform for being able to engineer the, your product cell so that A doesn't reject but is B not rejected. 
Great. Um, I suppose one question that um, all of you have sort of touched on was uh, sort of the role of uh, regulators. So I sort of wanted to open this up to the whole the whole panel. But you know, what is the role of the regulators, and who regulates this sort of space, this stem cell transplantation technologies? So perhaps if I could start, I think um, really the ball is in the court of the TGA. These are a manufactured product. Uh, and, you know, as we've touched on today, they can come from the patient. So they can be autologous, they can be allergenic. Um, that means from a donor, but they could also be, a, a, as Richard said, from a donor and highly manipulated or from the patient and highly manipulated. And here, when I use the, the term manipulation, I'm thinking about uh, not only manufactured, uh, so a derivation of a particular cell type, but also genetic modification. So the classical framework with the TGA around biologicals really is, is geared around the, the former, the manufacturing of cells. I think when we start to talk about gene modification, and I suspect Richard's had some real life experience at this one, um, but once we start talking about gene, uh, gene modification, we'd also need to be considering other regulatory bodies such as OGTR, the Office of Gene and Technology Regulator, of um, Gene and Technology Regulator. Uh, so there's a, a sort of a matrix of regulations uh, and, and the other kind of column I would put in there would be also the, the, the uh, APRA, the Australian Health Practitioners Regulatory Agency and their role and responsibility in oversight of medical practice. So once the the product, of course, is, is approved or perhaps it's not been approved, they certainly have a role in terms of what's being offered and provided within the Australian healthcare landscape. So the, it really does require a um, combined uh, oversight between different existing regulatory bodies, but I, I see it very much squarely, particularly at this early stage, sitting in, uh, in the TGA's court. Just yeah, I just had, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I was just going to say we we went to the TGA, and they thanked us for informing them of what what we were supposed what they were supposed to do, which was <laughs> a bit of a surprise. We we had an hour meeting with them, we went, which went for five hours, and they finished up asking us a whole lot of questions. Uh, so, um, notwithstanding that, we we. Uh, gone by the FDA because they just have more experience in this sort of technology and and nothing against the TGA, they're just undermanned. But, I think um, that's, a, that's a great point, Richard. And I think when I was using TGA, I was talking about regulators more broadly, but sure. using the Australian example. But that's an interesting point that uh, as an Australian company, you've gone FDA. As yeah, a, sure. yeah. We haven't got approval yet, so I may change my mind. <laughs> But I think it's an interest. I think it's an interesting point, Dave, around being the first cab off the rank. You know, so Richard and, and his team are a pioneer in this area, and they are forging new grounds. And 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 the, the regulatory models, as I kind of alluded to, are uh, for existing kind of products, existing biologicals. And what Richard and Claire and other colleagues are doing is kind of pushing the parameters, mm. and they sit across or within or outside. And we and that dialogue with the regulators is really essential to keep them abreast of what's happening in the field. Yeah, that's what I was going to add, is how do we educate the regulatory bodies about cutting edge technologies so that they're informed to be able to make the right ethical, appropriate decisions? Yeah, Which is why that's... FDA is attractive by, by comparison to the TGA at the moment. Yeah, well, take CRISPR, for example. I don't think there's any, any trials at all in Australia yet with CRISPR edited genes, which uh, ourselves at least, but we've, we've, we've got a, a backlog of uh, at least two or three cell lines within CRISPR edited. So it's pretty hard to call on the TGA there for, from their experience with, with CRISPR, but the US, of course, are all over it. So that's just one practical example. Can I ask a, a question, Richard? So when you're thinking about then performing your clinical trials that you have sort of regulatory approval from FDA, are mm -hmm. you restricted in where you can perform those or can you perform those trials anywhere in the world? Or how does it how does that work once you sort of have yeah. engaged with the regulators? Well, I, I think <clears throat> I'm not sure whether you can go anywhere in the world, but at least in the in the major regular major environments like Europe, UK, Australia, 
the the FDA approvals is a you can transfer it across. So it's a reciprocated across the different yeah. jurisdictions yeah. It, as long as they have sort of an understanding. Yeah, the the Europeans have got a slightly stricter uh, stance on phase one trials. They want everything from day one to be GMP, whereas the FDA allow you in, in the first in human phase one, you, you don't have to have full GMP. It should be clinically clean, of course, but it doesn't have to be done with all the rigors of GMP. But FDA is generally considered to be the gold standard and, and that's the biggest market. So that's why we went there. I suspect also the investors might like that too. That little chestnut, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perfect. So I'd like to uh, open up to the audience to, to ask some questions and I think there's one here that sort of uh, overlaps. Um, but uh, I suppose talks a little bit about it, but perhaps from concept to products, like um, how long does it take um, and how much, how much money does it take to do that? Do you want me to have a crack at that one since we've yeah, done it? Yeah, the first track you want, Richard, yeah. We started in 2016 with, uh, with a failed NH and MRC grant, but at least I learned about CAR T-cells writing it. A cornerstone investor and some pretty good ideas. So uh, our first clinical trial is actually going to take place this year. That gives you an idea of the timing from 2016 to, to now. That's a, an autologous CAR-T trial in ovarian, relapsed ovarian cancer. Uh, it, it should be this year, latest next year. Our induced pluripotential stem cell derived products will be, uh, we hope to get the IND, which is the in investigation new drug um, declaration from the FDA in 2024 and we hope to be in the clinic with that end of 24 or 25 that's you know, assuming everything goes well so it's about a from from scratch to now is about a seven-year program I guess and um, as a company we've raised in excess of 40 million bucks so it's kind of give you the idea of the, the kind of dollars involved um, and it, it, it continues to mount, of course, as, as soon as you get towards the clinic and you have to scale up your method of manufacture. Um, the advantage of stem cell world, I mean, I'm preaching to the converted here, but you can generate a lot more cells from a stem cell than you can from a, an adult tissue. So there's a, economies of scale that make it a, a little bit cheaper, a lot cheaper, actually. We hope to get the the cost of a, of a CAR-T drug down under under 100,000, maybe between 50 and 100, depending on how the scale goes, so about the tenth of the cost. Can I ask Richard a question, Dave? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, so Richard, so you have, so you're also, I suppose, trying an adaptation of the CAR-T technology. It's already kind of in, in parallel, rushing ahead, but that uses autologous cells, doesn't it? That's so right. that's what you yeah. meant, yeah. So that's one of the sort of market advantages. And how much does that product kind of roughly retail for at the moment? The autologous product is around half a million dollars. Yeah. So, boy, if you could get yours to work, it'd be a huge... Yeah, it's a massive... And it's huge just, reduction. Yeah, it, it becomes... You, you can't imagine that sort of cost being translated to a large number of patients. I mean, there, there's, I think, five cartridge... Uh, products now which have been approved by the FDA TGA but it's a long way to go and there's still the cost of manufacture hasn't gone away of course it, it just because you've got to improve it doesn't make it cheaper puts more demand on supply actually mm -hmm. I suppose I have but, a follow-up question oh, go ahead Richard yeah. I was just going to say in, in the context of this discussion which I'm really enjoying I think it's a fantastic um, topic Australia lags behind facilities to expand cells, for example. We we wanted a GMP and we work with very closely with cell therapies and in fact we've got grants with them and they're, they're going to be producing our cells for a clinical trial. Uh, um, but in terms of GMP manufacturing facilities and cellular expansion facilities in this country, we're, we're pathetic. There's, there's nothing. We looked at over 100 sites to try and create even a PCT laboratory. We finished up having to renovate and it turned out to be a great uh, application. We, we took over the old 7-Eleven offices and now we've got fantastic new labs and 
clean rooms and so on. But it was a it was a long arduous pro program. We we need more support for the translation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that, and I'm probably a bit biased with the sort of ACMD coming online here at Melbourne News a part of. But um, yeah, certainly there's a, there's been historically an issue in, in Australia with translation for sure. Yeah. Um, just relating to, I suppose, some of the costs that you were sort of mentioning there, Richard, I was just, I suppose, interested in a, a question here that relates to, um, you know, quality and access to healthcare. So how suitable are these sorts of technologies for, you know, low and, and middle sort of income countries? Well, I think if you, if you just take the autologous CAR T as a model at the moment, it's really not practical. And some of the companies that have been involved with it are, are pulling out because of the costs. And, but there are ways through it. And it, it, any new drug is expensive to start off with, but with time it gets modified and you get better method of manufacture and slicker technologies and so on. So I think that um, just logic tells me that if, if you can generate and take an induced per potential stem cell related uh, therapeutic cell and you can generate maybe thousands of doses from the one master cell bank that must have a re major reduction in the costs for that cell to be infused into patients that's what we're working on at the moment so this, the the economies of scale in, in scarlet manufacture the, tr the trouble is with scarlet manufacture you, you start with a nice little petri dish or a flask or a six well plate and you think right now i'm going to generate a couple of hundred billion cells to treat half the world it's it's not a straight line unfortunately you, you, you double the size of your vessel doesn't give you double the size of double the number of cells so there's a whole lot of cell biology that we need to understand and i think a, a national effort at that sort of thing would be would be would be brilliant everyone should share their experiences mm -hmm. megan and claire would you like to add anything to uh, I think that question of equi equitable access, you know, is something obviously from an ethical perspective we should always be conscious of. And I think it's not going to be answered initially, but certainly something we should be looking toward the long term. And, and, and that comes really around how we deliver these cells. So, so different methodologies, you know, if, if you can get an off-the-shelf product that provides the same benefit, then that's going to be so much easier to disseminate and distribute from a central location, from a specialty laboratory, than if you have to manufacture at site. Um, that perhaps is is one of the restrictions at the moment, or or relying on very sophisticated transportation of cells around the world, collected in one place, shipped somewhere else for manufacturing, and then shipped back to the patients. Those costs. It's hard to see how. Um, countries that are developing would, would be able to afford that. And then I think it comes back into kind of my areas of concern, which is do they then get offered something that's a mirage of the high quality product? And I think we have to really be conscious of that, that that, that sort of we don't have a divided world where those who can afford uh, can get... Um, um, the benefit and those that, that can never afford are always restricted. And I think during the rollout of the COVID vaccine across the world, we did see some really sensible efforts to try to bridge those gaps. Mm -hmm. So I hope as we see cellular therapies further maturing and, and becoming um, part of accepted medicine, we're always thinking, how does this equate to, to countries around the globe? To add to that one, I think um, it, we often talk about precision medicine, making the perfect medicine for the for the individual and what they suffer. But as Richard and Megan have alluded to, customised medicine is so expensive. We've touched on solutions here today, um, and, and and I think we can see as a field how we may progress forward to enable. Um, those in lower socioeconomic environments to be able to get access, and that really will be things like a stealth or a cloaked cell line in the future that then will enable us to do, you know, bulk manufacturing and cryopreservation of cell products that can be disseminated around the globe. That will be, in my opinion, that will be the way forward. And I'm, I mean, it, it's a hard reality, but part of it is at the moment to get evidence of efficacy and safety 
that is happening in these first world nations. And once we've got that and, and build the in infrastructure to enable us to go on mass with some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And in principle, that sort of answers one of the, the questions from the audience, actually, which was, can these procedures deal with conditions that are relatively sort of rare? So perhaps you need just sort of a more generalised approach to, to sort of rare conditions. Uh, do... oh, I think you have to be careful, sorry, Dave, around generalised approach. <laughs> um, I, think the, I think the rare disease community is huge. Uh, but there will be nuance within that community. So again, you know, the same product won't be able to be rolled out necessarily to every rare disease, but perhaps, as Claire said, once infrastructure is developed, once there's proof of concept, it might be then more attractive for investors, for, for commercial partners to move in and looking to uh, meet those unmet needs. But I, I think the rare disease community is actually... Um, if you look at it across the board, is actually a, a very large sector. So, mm -hmm. I, and I think I, I wanted to raise the issue of, of transparency and and sharing knowledge, because I think that even though there will be some commercial restrictions in some facets, I think one, what, one of the priorities of the field is to make sure that we are, you know, as we are solving issues, as we are reaching um, and, and addressing some of these barriers, we're sharing that across the field so that perhaps again, um, the researchers who are working within rare diseases are gonna benefit from the learnings from, for example, the Parkinson's disease community. I think just one thing to clarify there was when we talked about a when we talk about a cloaked cell, we're talking about a stem cell that can be used to generate a variety of different cell types. So we could be making a heart cell we could be making a brain cell, we could be making a liver cell. So it's, it's having a cell that will be usable in terms of um, across the spectrum of disorders where graft rejection is always a problem. Um, but then second to that is, as we mentioned earlier, is it's critical to understand a mechanism, mechanism of disease to know what we need the cell product to be. So I can see in the questions there was something about ataxia, we're likely to need a very defined cerebellar cell type and that the cell we try and generate for Parkinson's disease, which is a dopamine neuron, are very different cells, but they could both be generated from a cloaked cell type. So it's a universal cell that then can be rolled out across applications. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I was going to raise it too, that if, you, if you've got a, a standardised technology and, and I'm batting for the IPSCs at the moment because they, they seem to work, and they, by the way, induced proof potential stem cell lines vary from one to another as well. You've got to you've got to select on which is best for your application. But once you've got that master cell bank cloning, editing, safety technology in place, it, be, it becomes a bit of a plug and play. Mm. So um, I, I think that getting the the right platform technology is a hugely important thing, and it can have then wide applications. Um, a couple of the members of the audience have um, asked the same question. So, and it relates to how do we best educate the public about treatments so that they can make informed decisions when they may not sort of understand the highly technical details of the of the science behind the technologies. Get Megan to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. <laughs> oh well, look, maybe I'll just I'll start by saying that I think it requires. Um, not just one one thing it requires multiple um and i think coordinated strategy I, I think we as a scientific community have long acknowledged this area uh this challenge um and and i think we have produced some good material but are we getting it out there so you know one of my um one of the ways i think we could work best is by partnering closer with the patient support groups and services that are already in the community. And, and I know Claire and, and, and Richard over the years has also, have also done work in this area. They already are a trusted source of information. So I'd like to help them help their members. I think that's a really good uh, approach. Um, and, and also that's where I find out a lot of really interesting stuff by listening to those communities. But at the end of the day, we also have to be able to respond to the individual. And um, that's probably best done through their doctor, through their specialist. And perhaps we need to be putting some effort into making sure 
uh, the future, our current practicing um, healthcare professionals, not just med, not, not just doctors, but others who work in the sector, are comfortable having those conversations. So one of my kind of interests is how do we help doctors have those difficult conversations? You know, we're not there yet for many of these applications, but we don't want people to necessarily give up. Uh, we want them to place their hope in medical research, but not necessarily hope in a mirage. So I'm really interested in a kind of a multifaceted approach. So I think we have to have information that's available online. I think we perhaps need to do that in a, in a cleverer way. I think um, we could learn a lot from perhaps some of the clinics that make some uh, unfounded claims uh, around how they use um, patient voice, for example. Um, maybe we need to have a few more patients uh, visible speaking about some of these challenges and not just us speaking perhaps at or down to them. So I'm really interested in different ways of communicating, but I think as a sector, we have a huge responsibility here. Uh, and it's something that I certainly want to keep uh, keep chipping away at, but it's not easy. Media is the only other thing I would just flag. I think we, as in the scientific community, perhaps um, need to be a little bit more uh, firm when there's misrepresentation in the media uh, and, and clarify. Uh, I think that the, so often the, the snappy headline and um, the simplistic version is easy to put out and put out in the, in, and, and perhaps ignite the flame of hope, but yeah. um, we need to be able to contextualise that and, and we need to be you know, actively engaging with media and be proactive rather than reactionary. Maybe, Megan, we should re revisit the old stem cell awareness days and, mm. and make more annual well, information. I'm, I'm delighted to say, Richard, that on the 10th of October, that's exactly what my international group are doing. So uh, we, Richard, we started. I was about to say, I was just about to acknowledge that Richard, Richard and the Monash group were very instrumental in, in, in starting that. And it's it's usually in October, isn't it, Richard? So yeah. First no, or second were, week in October. You were with us too. So. <laughs> no, we've let, I, I think we, we really need to reintroduce that public awareness campaign. I think the fact that, you know, a lot of us have been working in the space for a long time and I feel like we, we have done good things and maybe we feel we might have done enough good things, but the field changes. And then we have another generation of patients that don't haven't heard the perhaps the discussion and, and the start of the, the kind of marketplace of unfounded uh, treatments and, and haven't heard of that and perhaps listen to Joe Rogan, um, who, who has a very highly listened to podcast on uh, Mel Gibson's father's plight, um, that I, I have had people quote to me as a source of their information and inspiration for pursuing treatment in the Bahamas. Uh, or, or Panama, exactly, actually. Um, so, you know, you f I think we forget that um, there's another generation of patients coming through all the time or people coming in. I think generation is perhaps a poor use of words, but uh, 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 people are entering this space all the time and so it needs to be actively managed. And I, I think it's also to add to that, I think you've touched on all the major groups. It's informing our clinicians who are you know amazing at what their jobs are but it's very difficult for them to stay up to speed with what the technologies are because i i agree i think your first point of call is your clinician um but to make sure that they've got that balanced information as well mm. and our advocacy groups of course so i, I had a follow-up question here relating to um the immune response um and it's uh, is it possible to predict and select for patients that have a higher risk of rejection and so that we can sort of monitor, monitor them um, post-administration. Yeah, there's been a, a huge, huge history in this game and the clear uh, solution is getting as close an MHC match as you possibly can. And uh, therein lies the, the, the idea of getting these induced proof potential stem cells from the HLA haplotype donors, but you can, you can, so that, that's the first test is the genetic similarities between the donor and the host. Uh, you can also look for whether the host has preformed antibodies to the, to the donor, that, that can happen. And in the old days, they used to do this thing called the mixed lymphocyte reaction where you, you take the 
lymphocytes from the donor and the lymphocytes from the host and mix them together in a test tube and let them go for it and see if there's a reaction. And if there's a reaction, you know you've got to step in with some controls. But, um, but most of the technology at the moment is based on and genetic uh, so compatibility and then selecting the right kind of immunosuppressive therapy to go with it. Okay. it, it the uh, field of transplantation has actually advanced quite a long way. I had a, uh, another follow-up question too. I think we've mentioned things like suicide genes and um, CRISPR. Um, and the, the question just related to, um, I suppose, the future of uh, genetic engineering. What do you think that looks like in relation to the, the cell transplantation technology? I think it's here to stay, and I think it's an amazing... It, it, I'm still in awe of the fact that we, we used to know, didn't know what DNA was, then we worked out how to read it, then we re worked out how to modify it, now we write it. Yeah. And uh, this is a technology which is, a, which is amazing. And I think it's here to stay. And the more precision medicine, CRISPR is just opening the door, but there's now more refined ways of using CRISPR or CRISPR type en enzymes that give more site specific integration into the into the genome. So I think this is an area which is which is just going to get bigger and more important. And there's uh, evidence it's already moving in this space. Absolutely. Like, you, like Richard mentioned, it's already had trials go through the FDA. Yeah. And I think and that I was, about, I was about to add, uh, sorry, Dave, that 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 the that, that sort of difference between gene therapy and using stem cells to perhaps, and here I'm thinking about hemopoietic stem cells as a delivery of um, corrected stem cells. I think that difference. I think both are really important, but I think they are also quite distinct. So gene edited cells going back into people versus the actual gene therapy vector. Uh, I think both we're going to see absolutely in incredible uh, benefits uh, too, but I think that there are some s subtle challenges that are, that are interesting uh, and worth also thinking about as, as both those fields go forward. Okay, so perhaps just one last question to uh, finish up today's discussion, but um, in what application um, do you all think cell transplantation has the sort of most rapid opportunity to, for translation? I think it's you, Richard. Who's going to roll out their favourite baby? <laughs> I think CAR T cell uh, therapies are happening. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. Mm. Uh, that's that's right. Claire. The, the, the the impact that um, CAR T cell therapies had is had on let's be let's be honest, it's only on some blood limb, blood neoplasia. But when you hear the word cure being uh, being actually used openly by clinicians, then you have to start taking up and, and sitting up and taking notice. And uh, the big challenge in the car, chimeric engine receptor field, whether it's NK cells or T cells or even macrophages, is to knock down the wall that solid tumours represent. And uh, they have a physical barrier which uh, of these mesenchymal stromal cells, which are also immunosuppressive, so you kind of block any immunity to them. But, but to answer the question, Dave, I think that I think that the immune system is probably ahead of the game at the moment. But um, firstly, I'm hoping the clear and the neurologists can lift their game and get me fixed. <laughs> and I, I was going to chip in and say the next sort of cluster of horses in the race for me are, are those attempts where uh, to treat conditions with a single type of cell affected. So here I'm, I'm thinking of Parkinson's and I'm thinking of, of perhaps some of the, the conditions around the eye, uh, retinal uh, issues, where there's, a thing, there's not that many cells required. It's a de very definitive phenotype uh, and we can already make those cells in the laboratory. The question is, how do we get enough cells of the right maturity in the right place at the right time? And I think there's still big hurdles there, but that, that would be the next cluster. I think other conditions that have a more sort of perhaps... Um, diverse presentation throughout, diffuse presentation throughout the body. I think they will be further down, but uh, down the list in the horse race, um, but that they would be mine. What about you, Claire? I, you I think it, it, it's that defined cell population and focal delivery. As soon as it's uh, many cell populations or across uh, large or diffuse areas, it's, it's a much, much greater challenge for us to manage. Dave, could I just add a little twist to that in that um, it's what task are we asking the transplanted cell to do? 
in the case of regenerative medicine, it's repairing damage and, and remaining there forever after. Whereas to the immune system against cancer, it can be a hit and run kind of thing. And in fact, you almost want it to be a hit and run because you don't want to have these cytokine storms that, which can occur. So it, that, that may be one reason why the immune system may, may be a little bit quicker into the clinic because of the, this hit and run rather than having to work out technologies for long-term retention. Great, yeah, that's a good point to finish on. So unfortunately, our, our time's uh, come to an end, but on behalf of the uh, MedTech platform and the University of Melbourne, I'd like to thank our panel for their contributions to the discussion. So thank you, uh, Claire, Megan and Richard for your, your time today. It's really appreciated. And thank you to our illustrator, Zara. It was uh, great to see those uh, illustrations popping up while we were talking today, trying to capture um, the discussions and the, and the learnings. So look at that, that's, uh, that's absolutely amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, the audience for all of your questions and, um, and interest in this important issue. We really appreciate your input um, and we have a, a post event survey which is located at the bottom of the video stream and within the uh, question and answer chat box. And we value your feedback to help us shape the future of our MedTech webinar series. So thank you everybody, stay safe and have a nice day. Thanks everybody. See you folks.